Um, OK, just in case this is all a big mistake, Open Embedded builds Linux distributions for embedded containers, whatever. The Yocto project is a Linux foundation project that supports Open Embedded. This boff is about building Linux distributions. If you are not here for that, you can leave now and we won't. That's all right. Okay, the last time I had a boff, I had a fellow interrupt me and uh, explain that I needed to cover all this stuff early on. Um, if you want to talk to us after this, we're on IRC on Pound OE and Pound Yocto. We have mailing lists that you can find at the Yocto Project website. And we're looking, we know a lot of people use the Yocto Project, but we don't know who you are. So if you go to yoctoproject.org slash users, it will steer you to a wiki where you can sign up and add your company, products, pictures of products, links to products are great. Um, I just saw Zephyr tweeted a slide with all the stuff that Zephyr runs in. And it would be fun to have a slide with people who will let us say they run Yocto Project built images in their product. So that's my plug for that. And now we'll have the updates from uh, Nico. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, a couple of updates. Uh, I mean, this is the buff, right? So we are just going to talk for a few minutes and then this is this weird moment where we are going to ask you for questions and we'll try to find people to answer them. So we'll see. So let's get for, uh, started with a few updates. I mean, the usual updates about the members. So we've got some uh, new members that sign up in, I mean, since I, not since the last time we've seen you because it's been a while, but recently. Uh, so BMW and Axis. Uh, one thing we've been doing lately, and mostly because we haven't been able to meet uh, in person, is we've started this Yocto Project Summit. Uh, we started with the first event, and we've been surprised that it has been extremely successful. So we've done a third one, and a third one, and a fourth one. And it's actually always been a very successful event. We've realized that <coughs> by actually going virtual, uh, we managed to reach out to way more people that we have been able to reach in the past. And that is exactly, I mean, as Philip was saying, one of the problems we have, we know the core developers, we know who are the people who have been uh, talking to us for the last 10, 15 years, but we don't know who is actually using the project, who is actually struggling with using the project and everything. So this summit is that, that gives us, I mean, this reach to everyone uh, out there. It's actually very inexpensive and very easy to join. So the last one was in May, uh, it was a good event. Uh, we have nine hours of video. So if you don't know what to do this weekend, you know what to do now. Uh, the next one is already announced, uh, so it will be November, at the end of November, uh, 20, uh, and yeah, so just make sure that you plan to attend. Uh, follow, I mean, we are going to announce, I mean, how to register, we are going to request, I mean, people to, for uh, speakers, and we are going to look for speakers and everything as usual. Uh, this is something which is happening right now. Uh, as usual, there will be also a developer meeting right after the Yocto Summit for Open Embedded, which is a day which is slightly less formal than the summit where we can talk about anything. I mean, all the people using, developing, willing to develop uh, open embedded uh, technologies just can meet and talk about anything. And soon we'll have a wiki page set up for the developers meeting so that we can try and collect topics so we can have a little bit of structure around the meeting. So think about topics you would like to talk about. And these don't need to be super complicated, in-depth topics. I mean, sometimes just good questions, you know, new user experience. Um, it's a good chance for people to talk to the developers. We don't have very good insight into um, how people learn to use the Octo project and how to get started because most of us have been doing this for so long, it just seems natural to us. And we know we need to work on that experience. Yeah. So we heard this week that there might be a force them again, like a, a physical event. Uh, last time there was a physical event, we had an open embedded workshop as, at Force them, uh, which was like, I mean, again, a bunch of people who care about OE just coming together, talking with speakers and everything. And that was actually a great yeah, we have about six hours of video. Uh, I'll say, so that's more for the next weekend. Um, so we, we do want, I mean, if it happens, we do want, and we, we, we will try to have an OE event again. So again, I mean, this we just learned about that yesterday, so yeah. we'll see. But uh, if you want to help us with that, uh, you know how to find us. But yeah. that could be a good way to actually meet again. Uh, of course, we cannot talk about updates without talking about the next Yocto release. The one thing Yocto is good about is there is always a new release soon. Uh, we've been making release every six months for the last, I mean, 10, 11 years. Uh, so Fallout 1 is expected next month, uh, within a month from now. And yes, yeah, so I mean, there is 
the usual set of uh, um, updates and improvements. I mean, update to the recipes. Uh, something which is, I mean, significant update. Uh, we have talked about Rust for different reasons earlier today, uh, but we also have seen some uh, significant Rust improvements in, in, in the core. And something which is also, I mean, uh, a big request for many, many years is the, the, the layer setup stuff. So for finally, uh, we have something uh, that has been merged to actually allow, um, I mean, like a standard for how we are actually supposed to manage layers and, 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 and more than just Pocky. So we'll see, it's just the beginning. We want that to become uh, the standard in the future and we finally emerge something. Redis will be out uh, hopefully uh, within a month from now. LTS, um, this, we started discussing, talking about the LTS, uh, LTS, I think three years ago. I think now we can say it's, uh, it's, it's a big success, it's being used. Uh, I think we are going to even do a little game here, but yeah, um, yeah Dunfell was the first LTS. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, the York 2 LTS are supposed to be uh, for two years. Uh, when we reached two years for Dunfell, there was like uh, this idea that maybe two years was not enough. So we are doing an experiment to maintain Dunfell for four years. It does cost resources, money to actually, and it actually is a very big community for to maintain LTS. So we are doing an experiment with an LTS for four years, which is, we are in this very old situation where Dunfell and Kirkstone are both going to be supported until the same uh, 2024. We'll see what happens. Maybe the experiment will tell us that we should not do four years. Maybe it will tell us that we should do four years. Uh, so that discussion will happen at some point, I expect next year. Uh, but yeah, so this is a significant uh, effort for the project. Uh, there are like uh, a thousand changes every year now since we started just for the LTS. So we have a dedicated maintainer for that and a lot of people are actually, I mean, working on the LTS. So it's a significant effort from the project. It's been a lot of discussion to start it and I think it's a success. And maybe it's, I mean, comes, it comes with issues as well, but so far I think it's been a success. The game. Okay. So we tried this on Monday and I used a very bad format. So I'm going to try a new format. Who here is developing or maintaining products based on releases older than Dunfell? Okay. And don't, don't be embarrassed. Um, so who here is maintaining products based on Dunfell? Okay. Um, who here is maintaining anything on Kirkstone? Um, is there anyone in between Kirkstone and Dunfell? Okay, so there are people not on the LTS in between. And how many people are building against master? All right. Okay, so a bit more variance. Yeah. Sorry, what do you say? Master next. Well, who is using next? <laughs> Okay, again, uh, this is going to be a big discussion next year. What do we do with the LTS moving forward? And uh, yeah, so, I mean, we might, I mean, this is like kind of a little game today, but that yeah. gives us some idea. Uh, but yeah, we're, we are going to have this discussion at some point, so. Yeah, all right. Okay, so one thing I actually like to do um, from time to time is to look at, I mean, okay, I mean, how are we doing and how many changes, how many developers and so on. Uh, so, and yeah, there is a little story I wanted to actually share today. So if we look overall, I mean, since, I mean, a, I mean, a long, long time ago, uh, what we see is that the project have been fairly stable. I mean, blue is the, all the changes, the commits that we do uh, to make a release and the yellow is what we do after the release, so in the stable branches. Uh, without many, I mean, m m many surprises, Dunfell is actually big in terms of the LTS. But what we see is that, I mean, overall, I mean, we have been able to produce, uh, I mean, a stable amount of uh, patches. Um, and, and it's basically like a, the sign of like a stable community and, uh, and a stable project, right? So we update the recipes and every six months and, 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 and it looks good. So now if we actually zoom a little bit and if we actually look at who is actually contributing to the core of the project and if we actually look at who is actually doing half of the work in the core of the project, what we see is, is, is a sign that, I mean, we have maybe, maybe we have like one of a problem that we see is that we have less and less people who are actually contributing to the core of the, pro of the project. So in blue, this is like how many people contribute 50% of the changes every year. And so what we see this year, we've reached the point where only four people have actually made 50% of the change in core. Is it a problem? Is it a big problem? Is it not a problem? I think it might be a problem. We know that uh, some of the maintainers are actually way overloaded. And this is basically like something I wanted to tell everyone that, you know, I mean, so we are looking for help all the time. We are always saying, uh, Richard is all very often sending email and asking for help. Um, what we 
what, what, what we see on the day to day actually can actually also be seen by just looking and doing some Git forensics. Uh, so this, there is a sign, I mean, this is post-COVID, so there are many different things happening. Uh, we will keep an eye on that, but definitely we need more people to help with the core of the project. We know that Yorktoo is used everywhere. We know that there are tons of very happy users that never complain because it just works. Maybe it's a bit slow to build, but that's, that's the only complaint we hear about. <laughs> but in the end, uh, you, everybody can make product because the core is there and the core is maintained and the core improves. And this year, again, four people have made 50% of the change. In red, it's how many people it takes to, to look at 80% of the change. And yes, yeah, so there is a trend in the last two, three years, which is not looking good. Now it's up to us to act on that, to think about that, and to see how we can fix that. So we are going to look at how we can attract new members to participate and join the project, to maybe found more developers. Uh, but we, um, we are looking at the current members to I mean, maybe spend more time on the core. Or we are looking at community members who also help with the core. So there are many, many things that can be done. Help us. Uh, I mean, I think last time uh, I said that documentation is one place, one easy thing that people can um, contribute and help us with. But it's not just about the documentation, it's about the core. If you actually do these uh, numbers for BitBake, I mean, the situation is even worse. BitBake, which is the core of the core. Uh, there are even less people which, uh, who are contributing to it. Again, it's, it's, it's a signal that we see and we need to be aware as a community and, and we need to think about that and to see how we can improve this. We are very lucky again that we have many users and it's extremely successful, but we have to also look at uh, what makes this project so that we can keep being successful. So, if you want to start helping, <laughs> Uh, one, one thing that comes in every buff, so before you ask the question, we have a slide today. Uh, how do I start and how do I start contributing? Again, um, we have had this question a lot and I think uh, Michael, which is, which, who is with us today, has done a very good talk at the last Yocto Summit and we actually kind of asked him to do it. Uh, we wanted to have a place where we can send people. So you want to start contributing. I mean, you want to find a mailing list. You want to know how to send a patch. You want to know how to join our community. There is a really, a really good talk from Michael. And this should be, I mean, something that everybody who wants to join us uh, should actually uh, look into. So it's, we know it's slightly difficult for new people to join. There are a few things which are complex with the Octo Bit Bake Open Embedded. But in the end, I mean, it does complicated things, right? So you, you cannot do, I mean, it cannot be simple. Uh, but uh, we are usually known to be nice people, uh, welcoming people on emails most of the time. So yeah, we encourage everyone to join. So that's what the stories we wanted to tell you. Now we have, I actually don't even know how much time we have. I think we have 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, the usual format is that um, we're here. Uh, we are here to hear the questions and to find in the room who can actually answer the question because most of the time we don't know the answers ourselves. So if you have a question, say it out loud. Uh, we will repeat the question. I think we have to repeat the questions and then we'll find someone to help uh, with the answers. So now this is the most important. Oh, usually we have an issue with the first question. What is considered core, BitBake? Uh, BitBake, uh, OpenMedit Core, the documentation, uh, may, I mean the Pocky, I mean Distro, which, which yeah. Ah, oh, sorry, I forgot to actually repeat the question. The question was, what is the core of the project? So that's basically the Pocky Gitry, in a sense. Yes? I'm now wondering, and I have an application which itself, code base, contains different components. How do I model that in a recipe? Okay, so. Uh, so there was a really good presentation today about SBOM. Um, and so what you have is an application and you want to know how you split your, how you can actually design the recipes uh, where you're an application which includes multiple applications? Yes, so the application components like, contains other components like whatever it is, like Zlib, as part of the application code base. Okay. And there's like one recipe that builds that application. And um, yeah, so how, how does, what can I do so that the, that zlib then ends up in the SBOM? Okay. The artist, the artist will link it to the next letter required. So it should already be picked up in the SBOM. So there is no R depend because it does not depend on the zlib recipe. Yeah, yes. then, then so what I already do is like it's part of the licenses, that's fine. Um, but how does it end up then in the SBOM? The, well, two answers. The first one is don't static to the end. Never put a picture of the way. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, the other comment I would have is if you have something that includes the, co the source code tracing back that you're using Zlib, is it going to be very helpful because you're going to have the local copy of Zlib and that's the one you're going to care about vulnerabilities in? So if there's a problem in the local one, I would expect it to be reported through the, the project that includes it. Definitely not a good idea to have yeah. components in the code. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is definitely. Uh, I, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. But it's just like, hey, uh, like commercial products, and you have to yep. work with legacy. Like yep. and you cannot change everything at all. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think it's a very good question for Joshua and some of the other SBOM people is what is the right thing to do in that case? Is that something you can bring on a mailing list? Do you think? Um, so, hang on. Subscribe. Can you talk into the microphone? Yes. Um, so there was a discussion about S bombs just happening today in the mailing list. So subscribe to it right now and jump in. <laughs> just one practical thing. We have uh, experts in that discussion. We have one more microphone here. I mean, it might just be simpler than just. I understand you're talking about something that's a commercial product or something like that, right? But in Fedora, in Debian, we, you know, this is vendored, right? You've vendored your libraries, right? And so the general approach that I would take is actually to, as service probably already hinted at, like de-vendor that, right? So, so you want to actually use the Zlib that's, or Zlib, sorry, that's available in, <laughs> you know, in, in Open Embedded and figure out if there's patches that are on top of that, right? So it might be a little bit more painful. Now, it gets worse if it's a specific older version of Zlib. Yeah. So then what you... So, but, but you're still not done, right? It's okay. So then what you do is you go and you look for, was there a version of that recipe in an older release of Yocto Project? And then grab that recipe and make that recipe work. So you still get away from the vendored Zlib you're still building it with Yocto project and you get all the benefits of that, but there's still a little bit of more work there because you might have to change the syntax to the release you're on and things like that. But Or we find out what the right answer is for vendored yeah. code with respect to S-bombs. Right. So so there's the S-bomb question, but also just in general, <laughs> all of us are going to tell you to run away screaming from vendored code. It's, yeah. it's a bad idea. And the reason isn't because of the S-bomb stuff. It's because of the vulnerabilities and security stuff. You're not going to find it. You're not, you're not going to be able to decouple that. Exactly. You're not going to decouple that, and you're going to end up with security problems in the future. So but just... the, the question already was about the yes, bomb. I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So, I understand. I mean, yeah. That, but, there may, maybe there is something we can change to actually support that. I mean, so it works with yes, bomb. Yeah. In the... I mean, it's a great question the rest the is, people. Yeah. With the exception of Golang, because you can't get away from that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. No, oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who went first? Oh. Uh, getting back to the core developer question, uh, there was maybe like experiments open up to this GitHub workflow. Are there numbers available how many first time contributors have got up to core? Or like like an overall partial result, what the feeling is of this new workflow? What is this new workflow? The meta GitHub. Met GitHub. Yeah, I know, yeah, but I mean, we don't um, use GitHub in the core. Uh, but you mean on Meta Open Embedded? For instance, in Orbit, there was this new instance, I forgot about the name. But there was simply like a parallel workflow which opened up like contribution support over this new uh, detour of GitHub. Yoi? Yeah. Could probably Yoi. That was Hem's uh, thing, so Hem is not here. Hem is not. I, I don't think we can give a meaningful answer. Uh, would be nice to have him on the phone at least. Uh, I'm going to digress. For OE, it's not for the core. I want to digress a little bit because I've been meaning to say this all week is 
I very much understand people's desire to use a GitHub workflow. Um, Richard is very married to using the email workflow because it's what it's used to and it's hard for him to change. Um, I would also tell a story from the good old days when um, Open Embedded was running in BitKeeper. And so we're dependent on a proprietary workflow, which the GitHub workflow is proprietary. And if Microsoft decides to chase everybody off to make money, we would have to change our workflow to something else. And I know that when BitKeeper closed to open source projects, you know, it was a year or so of bad times for Open Embedded because we had to find a distributed version control system very fast and it was not fun. Um, that said, we are very interested in the conversation about does changing workflows, what workflows should we undertake, you know, given what I just said, um, how can we be more inclusive for developers as well? You know, is our workflow turning developers off? Um, and that's a very good conversation to have with us offline at the booth or things like that. And would changing the workflow address the core developer issues? I mean, that, that's a good question. Yeah. We don't know. That's the funny part. We talked about it at the last virtual meeting, I think. Yeah. So for, yeah. for, well, we, 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 uh, Cam, I mean, the, the, Cam, Cam is the one doing that. I mean, so Cam for yeah. Meta Open Embedded is actually. On the, on the video. We don't have a mic with him. Sorry. So the oh, oh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Thank you. Oh, we get, need to get used to that. Uh, so the question was, um, so there at the last uh, developer summit, we talked about uh, using some GitHub-based uh, workflow. And the question is, do we have results? I mean, do we have new people, contributors? Do we have way more developers because of that? So this is uh, not used for the core, your two core. It's being used for meta open embedded. And no, I mean, I, we don't have now. Uh, but this is a good thing. I mean, we should check. I mean, I, I can talk to Kem and see if we have data. Uh, Kem is actually man, uh, maintaining meta open embedded and is taking both pull requests or email. And so we can actually, I mean, I, mean I, I suspect it's going to be a lot more emails, but it would be interesting to see if the GitHub workflow is actually bringing new people. That would be actually an interesting data. So we, we, we can look into that. Yeah. I mean, the, the problem with using it for core is there's a lot of automation built up around email patches. Um, and the automation would have to be rebuilt to work with pull requests as well. Uh, in my personal opinion, if you want to introduce this um, GitHub style thing, you shouldn't be starting starting with GitHub. You should be starting with Source Hut because that was built from the ground to combine uh, the web, the pull requests, and the and the emails, and GitHub just isn't. I mean, the idea yeah. the idea of having a place where there would be all the layers and all the, con I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this has been discussed. I mean, this is, it looks, it looks compelling. Like if you look at what Debian's doing, well now, I mean, I think pretty much all the packages are on the same place. That looks compelling. I mean, are, are we going to get there? I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is definitely the, the things that, uh, discussions that need to happen. But when we start saying you want to use GitHub or one of these web-based workflows, right? So now you're expecting all of us to review and contribute and, and comment in a place that we aren't actively using now, which means we have to do it in two places or three or four or 10. Okay. The other problem is it's not just the, the vendor problem is where is the history of all of this discussion? So mail archives are really, really easy to store and keep, but we are at the mercy of the vendors for the history of all the discussion and everything that happened there. So like a lot of communities use Slack as their chat, right? But if you're, if you're not using a paid version of Slack, a month goes by and you lose all the history. So there's problems like that, that, that are the reality of why we, why it's not an easy thing to do. But uh, source hot may be the solution there because uh, it's explicitly about email workflows with uh, a web and I think that's the viable way and GitHub isn't. But when we hear that people ask for GitHub, I mean, like it is, yeah. it has become the kind of de facto I mean, place where, I mean, a lot of software is being done. GitHub but, uh, is becoming like Xerox. Yeah, but again. Well, but by GitHub, what is meant is that how can I send a drive-by patch quickly without subscribing to mailing list? And that's very useful, of course, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't have to be GitHub. Yeah. 
Uh, I believe he was next. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, you, you did a brief head count of which versions of Yahoo everyone's using. Anyone new to Yahoo or coming? Because I brought them up when I was there. Okay. <laughs> this might be a slight naive question for you to try then, but this month, uh, you know, Chile had a bit of a fiasco around their gluten from daylight savings for not and delaying it, and there was a rush with different vendors to, you know, change the pizza data package, uh, okay. not only Linux, Microsoft, everyone else. If I'm using Yocto, like, can I rely upon the base uh, core images that are provided that these will be expediently, you know, if things like that would be pushed up through? Uh, is it on me to really track that? Uh, what's the, that kind of flow? So what I'm going to say there is if you know that there's a can package... You can you repeat it? Oh, okay. So the question is... Um, how, how rapidly can we make changes in the core in master when we see a problem like time zone changes in Chile? Um, or, security. or security, but someone changing their time zones and there being a bit of a rush to update things. What I'm going to say is certainly raise the issue on a mailing list so we're aware that there's a problem because we don't have a lot of developers there and they may not be familiar, um, but in general, the time zone stuff is going to be in core and it's going to be watched pretty closely in terms of how often does the automatic upgrade helper run? Right, so in master we uh, twice a month run this auto upgrade helper that goes over every recipe and checks if there is a new upstream release and yeah. if there is then it tries to run DevTool upgrade on it and more than half of the time that succeeds and produces a patch that can be placed directly in master. And um, yeah, then it's on somebody, usually me, to actually <laughs> do this. And uh, so for things like time zones, um, the cadence is like twice a month and then that gets backported to Dunfell and other LTS releases. Or supported releases as well. Yeah, and if you're on a, a stable release, you might have to email the maintainer and ask what the status of getting the fixes backported. Okay. And the, I mean, you ask about TZ, but I mean, we also do that for CVEs and updates in general, right? So we can track we track the CVEs and per branch and everything. So this is, I mean, this is a general, I mean, cleaning work that which is happening in in the community. Yes. So just really quick, as far as CVEs, so um, the, the stable maintainer for the LTS releases, Steve Sakamon, sends out an email every Sunday for Master, Dunfell, and Kirkston for the CVE checker report. And just recently, we actually added the CVE check into the auto builder. So that check's actually also running on the auto builder. So if it's a CVE, we're going to catch it as soon as it's basically reported, right? We do our best to try to figure out if it actually applies. And then we try to you know, either fix the NVD um, database or take the patches you know, to actually fix the component or do the upgrade. Now that mostly applies to, to master um, because ma master can take any kind of upgrades of any kind. So when you talk about the stable releases, sometimes it's a little bit harder because we're not gonna do a major upgrade if it's not just bug fixes and security fixes right, because ABI breakage and things like that happen. But I'll give you an example, right, people were sending patches for Python. So we were on 3.8 Python in Dunfell, and people were sending individual patches to fix CVEs. But by definition, 3.8.y Python is all only bug and security fixes. So I went in and actually upgraded us to newer minor dot releases because by definition, it was in fact meeting our our criteria, right? So just just keep that in mind. And if you're looking to get involved, Steve Sackerman has a list of uh, CVEs and, du and Dunfell that need looking at. And he's running a competition now through mid-October where if you um, resolve CVEs in Dunfell, resolve the most CVEs in Dunfell between now and mid-October, he'll send you a pound of Hawaiian coffee that he grew himself. <laughs> so that could be a good place to get going. Uh, say that again. <coughs> okay. 
There's some details, and I would read the original email and not trust what I say. Um, okay, um, one point about this previous question uh, is that those automated updates that are twice a month, the outcome of that is posted directly to Open yeah. Embedded Core mailing list. And actually, it was posted today. There was this 70 uh, something emails from the robot. And uh, if you want to see, how this uh, master version upgrades work, uh, you should uh, look at those, like subscribe to the list and look at those emails. Um, okay, who was how next? We do it. Who was next? Yeah, yeah. Was it you or you? Oh. Do you remember? Yeah, I think it oh, was. I you. think it was him. Uh, so I have a practical question. We are not allowed to put the GPO3 stuff in our image. So we are using uh, uh, this feature which excludes the GPO3 I think I can Let's take this. We should summarize the question. The question is about uh, how to build uh, images without GPL-3. Uh, summary. <laughs> right. So um, the modern way to do this is to restrict the GPL-3 to a specific product image, like uh, the check that no GPL-3 is in the image runs at the moment when you actually do the image, but not any earlier. So you can build GPL-3 stuff to uh, produce some native binaries, you can build GPL3 stuff because it's a dependency of some testing packages that aren't actually going into your image, you, but this check you delay all the way to your specific image that is shipped to the customer. So that already eliminates a lot of issues. And then if you still uh, end up with something like uh, for example, bash into that product image and bash is GPL3, then you should look at what scripts do you have that are asking for bash and try to take them out of the image or uh, rewrite them in POSIX shell or uh, there is find some way out of it. If it's read line, this GNU thingy for like uh, having rich command line things, then almost everything has a package config that says disable read line. And then, okay, you don't have read line anymore, but then you don't have the GPL3 problem. So it's like targeted fixing until you arrive at the product image that has no GPL3 stuff in it. So there was a GPL or meta GPL v2? Yeah. Which is... Don't use meta GPL. Don't even mention it. Hello. <laughs> So I, I won't, I mean, should I repeat or should I not repeat it? <laughs> so there was a comment about there used to be GP, uh, meta GPL v2, but it is highly recommended not to use that anymore. So we, it's not supported and we do not want people to use that now. Yeah, and actually exactly in, the, in this conversation on the mailing list with uh, phasing out the GPL v2, there was the answer how to do it. Okay. You put the, uh, you take your incompatible license, you put it in the image. Okay, and that's what I was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the old way was that incompatible license was a, like a big project-wide uh, prohibition. And, uh, and now it's been changed to be specific to a specific image. So use that. Okay. Thank you. We're next. Yeah, I, I'd like to stay on the, on the topic of the CD. So they're uh, specifically the parsing list. Because in the database, sometimes you have like very difficult conditions when the CD applies. So you have to have this package and this package or this package plus this, maybe this configuration. If, are those particular situations attracted? Or we're just taking the, uh, the CD, we look at the package, there is a uh, CD entry, then we report that it's affected. Okay, so the question is, I mean, usually in the CV database, you have a complex a situation where you have complex combination of, I mean, multiple packages being present to actually have a CV to be impacted. Does Yocto support that? Yes. 
So basically it means a human being looks at that CVE um, once it hits the fact that it's, uh, that, that Yakta has been flagged as that, as that CVE affecting us. And then a human goes and looks at that and then makes the assessment. And then we either uh, ignore a list or whatever the modern term is, um, that CVE to say that it doesn't actually apply or we figure out where it actually does apply, or we're getting, we're probably becoming uh, pretty popular with the, the uh, database that we actually help them improve their, the quality of their data to, uh, to let them know when things you know, really don't apply. Um, so if it's super, super complicated like that, there, there's just no way we can automate that. So we, we're doing it a different way. Anyway. Manual yeah. Yep. So I'm and the audience discussion is basically at some point it becomes a manual process to read the CVE and figure out the exact issue. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, maybe a computer base here as well to, uh, to try to see if that one is going to be led. This is this vulnerability, exploitability exchange. Yeah. I just, you have to take a look. So I think one minute ago I was told we had three more minutes, so I guess we are. I'll just say we often usually look at like Debian or another distribution to see if they've already fixed and patched against that CVE or Red Hat or whoever. So, you know, that's, that's sometimes the easy way out and that's a good uh, way for you to help the project if you find one of those, just send, send some patches in. Okay. Anyone last? Yes. Can you repeat that? Uh, how to reduce the build time. How to reduce the build time. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry? So, I mean, the yeah. short answer is shared state. So nice state. very often when we get this question, um, I mean, users don't use them, the download cache, the state cache, I mean, properly. But I think we talked earlier today. And I think you claim, you say that you are mm -hmm. using it correctly and that you end up building home very often. And I mean, that is a very important situation where, I mean, it takes time. Um, I know, I mean, I mean, the, the other answer is to use, I mean, more powerful machines, more memory, I mean, all these things. But in the end, yes, I mean, we do spend quite a bit of time building. And anyone wants to, I mean, and you want to say more about your use case or? And you use a state cache and that's it, right? So why, w did, did you analyze why you, I mean, the builds takes uh, so much time? Or? So you, if oh. you don't have at least 12 cores or 12, you know, like 24 threads, that, that's kind of a sweet spot. So you want to get to that. You want to get to enough RAM for about 40, four gigabytes per thread uh, at least. So if you're, you know, if you're looking at building it on a laptop, you're doing the wrong thing. Um, yeah. If you're still using spinning rust for storage, switch to SSDs. Buy the fastest SSDs you can, you can get. NV NVMe, yeah. sorry, NVMe, yes. Okay, so I, I'll just give you an example. I built a, a Ryzen system. It's got 12 cores. It's got two NVMe drives and 64 gigs of RAM, and that builds just as fast as a 10-year-old dual Xeon box. So, and it, and it uses a lot less power. So, uh, but if you're really talking at scale, you know, th this is a very common question, and it's not a not an easy answer for the for everything, but um, the main the main thing is to reuse S state. If you're doing it in Jenkins jobs and things like that, don't be don't rebuild from scratch. Make sure you're reusing prior builds. Well, I would say that there should be a S state infrastructure, like a S state server, available to every developer in your organization, so that um, when things have built been built before, then they can be taken from cache, and nobody has to build them again. And that's like a IT problem. Uh, so you need to talk to your IT, I suppose, and uh, convince them that this has to be done because it saves a ton of money. 
Sorry. So just to add one thing. Do you happen to do you happen to use uh, autoref in one of your packages, for example? Oh. Ah, Steve. Oh. Um, so we we changed from autoref to fixed hash, and that brought build times down considerably. We also use started to use the hash equivalency server, that brought another improvement. But I, it, it can be that one package somewhere in the chain triggers it, right? So. You have to inspect it. It's not kind of easy. You have to look and find out what, what triggers your rebuild, what, what's causing the issue. If, if you don't yeah. have a package type either, switch from rpm.dk to plus option. Can be an option. So, sorry. Well, look in the build history. Build history is going to tell you what's, what's going to be the, uh, the top consumers in German. Yes, design. take the build history, create the, the look at the graphical output, uh, find the... Uh, find the uh, the bottleneck yeah build stats so, yeah build stats is is a tool that gives you i mean at the end of the build i mean what has been built and i mean and so that gives you hints about i mean where to look for i think we are out of time uh, so we are i mean we are still here tomorrow uh, maybe even this evening uh, we have the yokto booth where i mean Many people are there, so if you want to talk more and to any one of us, you are free to come to the booth. Thanks, everyone.